certain sense, you could say this is the whole, the whole point of the mimer to get to this, <coughs> is that the the statement the kibla Yehudi Mesasher Chelula Asos, the Jewish people received what they had begun to take upon themselves merely at Matan Torah, they finished at Purim, that Pasuk in the Megillah is said after the Gezerah is over, right? After Haman has already been killed and all of his house has been given over to Esther and there was the whole idea of his Havcha, which means after we had really good times, both physically and spiritually, we were on, the, we were on a high, just what? We were still slaves to a chashverosh. In other words, we weren't, we weren't having a hard time. We were just in gullis, so to speak, if you can say that. And he says, since that's, that, that, that also can bring you to a state of crushedness, because we said the idea of kusis lamaur, being crushed to reach the luminary, is specifically being crushed from gullis. So we said then last yesterday, there's two levels of being crushed from gullis. You're being crushed because the gullis is actually crushing you in terms of it's coming after you, it's trying to make decrees against Judaism and Torah and mitzvahs. And that's sort of like what we said in the time that Friedrich Rebbe wrote his mimer, Kibbalah Yehudim, that was going on. And that's what was going on during the time of the Gezer of Haman. But the actual line, the Jewish people received upon themselves what they began in Matan Torah, happened when we weren't being crushed in that way. We were just being crushed because it was Stam Gullus, even though we had everything good, <coughs> and so forth. But just because the Yid wants Elokus and it's not shining in like the way it was in the base of Mikdash, he's crushed just from that. And not only is he crushed just from that, he's crushed even more from that. It reaches to a higher level of the Ma'or, of the luminary, and that's why the, the line simply comes after the Gezerah is over. In other words, the postures of this drasha, you have to already make amends a little bit in order to amend it a little bit in order to make it go on the fact that you're being, it's during the Gezerah. The Pashtus, it's, to, it's talking about after the Gezerah. That's when you really reach the Ma'or. <coughs> so we say that even if a person in the Gullus will have the highest level of spirituality possible to him. It sounds like he's talking about a Rebbe here, basically. He does. He mentions in the footnote, Rebbe, even Rebbe, someone who could, who'd buy him the base of Mitzvah is never destroyed, like Rebbe Shimbar Yochai, Nonetheless, even a person like that is completely crushed from the gullus because since godliness is not shining to everyone, it's a proof that the godliness that is shining to him is still not completely unlimited. Because if it was really unlimited, everyone would see it. So therefore, this is a, a limited revelation. That's what we got up to yesterday. We're going to take it from page Kuf Lamed Hey. It's a, it's a powerful word right there. Kuf Lamed Hey, <coughs> about middle, a little bit higher than middle of the paragraph where the brackets start. Uh, you have one of these? Oof. There's one. Thank you, Hashem. What's that? Thank you, Hashem. For sure, that's what the Rebbe is saying. There is basically saying the difference between the, his, his Rebbe's generation and his generation. <coughs> so from the brackets there. This is what it says in the, it's brought in one of the Maimorium of the Altar Rebbe, where he says, the Isa Tikunim, it's brought <coughs> in the Tikunim, Tikuni Zohar, he says that even if one tzaddik would do a complete tshuva in his generation, Mashiach would come. What does that mean, a complete tzaddik? Isn't he already? Isn't he already? Yeah, it's like a... It doesn't say a complete tzaddik. Huh? Listen to the words. Even if a tzaddik would do a complete tshuva, it says. Tzaddik would be a complete tshuva. That tzaddik would do complete tshuva... Then Mashiach would come. No, it's not a complete tzaddik. It can be a complete tzaddik, but doing complete tshuva is something else. Yeah, what does that mean? <coughs> it means they're also working. In other words, they, 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 it, it, just because they're a tzaddik doesn't mean they don't have free will. Right? They have free will. Their free will is just not in the state of, like ours, that we have a choice to do bad or good. They don't really have a choice to do bad. Not an option. They don't have a Yetzirah. It's not even an answer. But they do have a choice to, to do... 
to do better. In other words, right. a, that's why you see that like there's this con- kind of constant state of restlessness that the, you see by the Rebbe. There was never a moment off, basically. But the idea is that if there would be such a person who would do complete tshuva in his generation, Mashiach would come. <laughs> So, you know, the, the, someone came in here yesterday telling me about a sikh from the Rebbe that at one point the Rebbe says, the whole thing at this point is just depending on Mashiach. We've done everything, we did, the generation did tshuva, We've, we're all like basically in place, and Mashiach needs to do something. He's holding back. <laughs> like, basically. The Rebbe was a complete tzaddik. Dude, going back on this point, it has nothing to do with a complete tzaddik or not a complete tzaddik. It's called complete tshuva. <laughs> if, if a tzaddik would do complete tshuva, apparently Mashiach would come. So what's complete tshuva for a tzaddik then? So tshuva, listen, I'm not saying Mashiach didn't come. The Rebbe said, frankly, Mashiach did come in our generation. Maybe he hasn't fully revealed himself, but he said Mashiach came. Kfar ba, he already came. But uh, the Rebbe doesn't lie. N- nonetheless. <laughs> no, but the point is, is that. Uh, Complete tshuva <coughs> is not <coughs> obviously not the same as a complete tzaddik. tshuva mamshichin gili orin sofa because he says through doing tshuva shleima. I mean, I'll grant you, it's definitely a, not the simplest thing to understand. But he says by doing tshuva shleima, one would reveal. The gili of the orange sof habli with the, the unlimited light of God would come. The gilu is there b'chol makom, and this light reveals itself everywhere. And it was, if it's unlimited, it doesn't have any limitations. That's part of it. So if it would happen, it would happen everywhere all the time. It, it, if the unlimited light was here, it would it would be unlimited. Every woman would experience it. Tshuva, <coughs> tshuva shlema brings a revelation of the true orange sof habli the unlimited orange sof. So if even one person would do perfect tshuva, something unlimited would happen, not just for him, because that's limited, but unlimited means it would be unlimited, the true unlimitedness of, of, of God. And that's what he's saying, that even though a person himself could be living in a state where it's complete Mashiach, where he is, he, like the, the Rashbi, he lived in a world that the, for him, the base of Mishnah was not destroyed. Because whatever like, world he was experiencing, it was a world of perfect godly revelation, but only to him. <coughs> There's a famous story like that of Menachem Vendel of Vitebsk, who's buried here in Tavera. He was like a very interesting character in history. He was really the, 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 the Rebbe, he was really the Alter Rebbe's Rebbe at a certain time. It's very, it's, it's, and the Rebbe even asked the question, <coughs> it's strange that we have to figure out a reason why he's not counted as one of the Rebbe's. You know, we talk about those nine Rebbe's from the Baal Shem Tov to the Rebbe. And it's very clear cut. Each one has a sphere out. It's a whole thing. Like these are the final <coughs> tzaddikim to live on earth, basically, before Mashiach. And the question is, like, rises in the, in the writings of Hasidus. Like, why isn't he one of them? He was that great of a person. He's considered to be the Nasi Adur. He wasn't on the list, but, like, why not? Anyway, by him... <clears throat> he lived in Tiberia, and someone came running in, and, and basically, and that, and the, the whole Hasidim they came here like mamish to bring Mashiach. It was very much a messianic movement when the Hasidim came from Russia to here. The altar was going to go with them as a whole thing, and he was like went halfway, and he decided, wait a second, if I go if I go with him, like who's going to take care of like all the flock here? And he, he like held himself back from going with his Rebbe. And they went, and they were mamish coming here to bring Mashiach. That was the end of it. Actually, came to Sfat first, because that's where Mashiach was to come. <coughs> they couldn't handle how spiritual it was, and they went down, uh, dropped to Tiveria. This is a true story. <coughs> they couldn't sleep because the angels were talking to them the whole night. It was a whole situation. <laughs> yeah, it was written. And they couldn't, they couldn't handle it here. They had to, they had to leave. It was too much spirituality. <laughs> There's a book called Priya Aretz, which is like the red letters of Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Mendel. Of Vitebsk to uh, Horodaka, they call him, to the Alter Rebbe and others in, in, back in Russia. They had, it's a whole book of letters. It's like many, many things we learn from these letters. In fact, the Tanya, which begins with the words that says, it's Alpi Svarim and Alpi Sofrim, you know, it's based on books and teachers. 
he is one of those those books that those letters are some of the t- letting, letters that wow. founded the, the foundation of the Tanya, according to the author of his own words. Serious guy. Anyway, my point from the story was <coughs> that he he was. They were all talking about Mashiach, you know. In, in Tveria, it was like a, a world of like Mamash Mashiach, and someone ran in. They said they're saying Mashiach is here, and it was like they remained. They meant it. So he said he looked out of his house and smelled. He like stuck his head out. And, and, and he smelled, he said, Mashiach's not here. So, so, so they said to him, like later on, they said, listen, like, why do you have to like stick your head out of the house? You know, if Mashiach's not here, you can stick your head in the house and smell. He said, no, because in my house, he is here. I wanted to see if he's here for everybody else. Wow. <coughs> so that's the idea. Chuva, apparently, tshuva shlema is not an easy thing to come by. What's shlema? Perfect tshuva. Oh, perfect tshuva. Well, Mashiach told Bashanto when the wellsprings, you know, spread. Is that kind of like now? It is. Listen, those. You wouldn't be crazy to say that we're in the generation of Mashiach and it's mamish happening, but it's not happening. It hasn't happened yet, in in full. <coughs> anyway, going on. So the very fact that by a yid. He doesn't shine by him the unlimited orain sov, not even by a tzaddik, but by you. Who nishba v'nidka. You're pushed broken from this. Kasis. In other words, you don't need a Nazi, Yamach Shema, Mastalin, to come after you, to make you feel the crushed of Golis. The fact that you don't experience Pasha the orain sov is enough to be crushed. There's, the world is broken. There's a lack of elokus. Broken. Nishba v'nidka is both broken and crushed. <coughs> <coughs> and Kassis. <coughs> and he says, this is al derech ha This is as it's known, she b'gematria mem tes. That the word for sick is the gematria 49. Shagam kishamei sig mem tes shari bina, meaning, even if you'll grasp 49 gates of bina, el shachasr lo shar hanun, you're just missing the one shar hanun, you're chole, that's the gematria of sik. Because basically, Sharanu is the 50th gate. The idea is that <clears throat> the 49 gates is like the ultimate perfection of every level. There's only 49 levels, 7 times 7. You know, like the, the counting of the Omer, we are like perfect our Midos. So you have every single one. You per- but what's missing is this, like this overriding Sharanu, this like sort of higher than the world. 7 is the number of the world. 7 times 7 is the shlemis of everything you can have in the world. But what? You're missing something completely supernatural. You're missing the Sharanun. It's called Chola. That's the definition of a sick person. It's 49. You have everything but, but, the, but the infinite. You're sick. That's like a, for, for a year, that's not enough. And it's known what the Tzemach Tzedek says, that he would hear from the Rebbe, his, his Rebbe, his grandfather, Admar Azakin, Ich was a garnist, garnist, sorry. Ich will nit dein ganeden, ich will nit dein olamaba, ich will da nit da it dichelein. I don't want, he says basically, I don't want anything. I only want you, basically. I don't want your ganeden, I don't want your olamaba, I want you alone. And this is basically poorly said Yiddish, but the idea is like this. That he had, Mamish, all the revelations of Olam Abba. The altar Rebbe, you're talking about a person who knew what Olam Abba looked like. Like he was a new Neshama, he, Mamish, knew what Gan Eden looked like. He was going and who knows what he would... And all of that was nothing. All the revelations that, that, that even the greatest Tzaddik could have, his claim was, I don't want any of it. I only want you alone. In other words, I don't want... Because revelations is cheap. I want the essence. In other words, the highest possible level. is missing anything... It's not the ultimate. Through the fact that this was heard <coughs> from the altar Rebbe, and the, the, it says, Haya Nishma means it was heard, means that it was something that was heard, not just at special times. This was sort of his normal way. And they used to say that there was, <coughs> his davening was, was such that his devakis and his uh, his excitement was such that 
he would lose his composure basically and start rolling around on the floor, the altar Rebbe, as it's known, in davening, and even sometimes saying my mari. And there was a, it's a known thing, that I, I think it's Reb Pinchas Reizitz was, was his number one choser, it was like his, <coughs> excuse me, the chassid that would remember everything he said, like we have also by the Rebbe, every word and write it down. So there's stories that he would have to like roll around on the floor with him because while he's busy saying the mimer, you know. So people heard what he was saying on there. They, were, they, they used to put pillows around to make sure he didn't hurt himself. He like lost himself completely. And he, this, is what, this is what he would say. You know, this was something that frequently happened and he heard it by him all the time. I don't want your gun and I don't want your Olam Abba. I want you alone. Like he was not satisfied with any type of revelations. He wanted the essence. Obefrat parsim <clears throat> that's one thing that the Alter Rebbe said it. It's another thing that this became publicized by the Tzemach Tzedek, which means it became sort of part of Torah Sachasidis. When something is publicized, it means it's for the generations. It's something that everybody <clears throat> it needs to know because it's relevant to everybody, that none of us should be slightly satisfied with any type of level that we achieve until it's mamish the level of the Geul Shlema. Right? You can't, there's a whole <clears throat> stories about the Rebbe talking about how we can't be satisfied and have sort of like a temporary rest. He was in the middle of a famous mimer. Mishakeles, there's a whole story about like a woman who was from Parshas Mishpati. He said in the early years, I think it was the first year of my mimer, in 1951. And he said that, uh, <coughs> he started to say how you can't have what's called svias ratzon. You can't have like satisfaction from anything you do because what are you satisfied for? You got some revelation, you got some light that came on. Did you, you're, you're still broken because I don't want your Gan and I don't want your Olam I want your essence. So the Rebbe was in the middle of saying you can't have this any satisfaction, which if there's one person in the world who like didn't rest for a second, it was him. And he actually couldn't continue the Mimer. And in the footnotes of the Mimer itself, it says he stopped and started crying profusely for like a long time in the middle of the Mimer. People were just sitting there watching him cry because he just let the words out about you can't have even a moment of satisfaction and he just broke himself. He couldn't go on anymore and he started bawling in the middle of this Mimer. You can't, what are you going to pat yourself on the back on? You, you learned the Tosafos? Did you see the Orein Sof? Because if not, keep going, you know? I don't want your Gan Eden. I don't want your Olam Abba. I want you alone. <coughs> so he says this, the fact that the Tzemach Tzedek printed it, it gives the power for every Jew, that his main will so this is not a small thing. He's saying because this was told to us, it made it so that it changed the fabric of a yid, actually, saying that it made it that our only interest is that we can have this feeling that all we want is Hashem. We can have this level that we're not satisfied by any revelation. This happened other times. There's a similar sort of lushan like this that it says that the Rebbe Rashab, when he was just four or five years old, he one time went into his grandfather. They used to get like go in their birthday for, to the, see the Rebbe, and he would like check him in his learning. And he went into the Tzemach Tzedek, and he said, "You know what did you learn today in school?" And he said, "I learned Parshas Vayera that Hashem appeared to Abraham when he was 99 years old. And wh why doesn't he appear to me?" That's what the little four or five year old um, Rebbe Rashab said. So the Tzemach Tzedek sent back a famous answer. He says, "Ayid." When he's 99 years old and he circumcises himself, you know, that's, that's when, I, that, that's when Hashem, you can uh, uh, expect that Hashem will appear to you, you know. But the Rebbe learned out from this. The fact that a four or five years old, which is a, which is a child, which is like before Chinuch, basically, he's really started six years old. And the, the fact is that he, he went in and instead of asking like for candy or, you know, for something, some kind of like a thing that usually excites a kid, he was saying, when is Hashem going to reveal himself to me? Like he, he, was, he was annoyed by the fact that he learned Torah and he didn't, <coughs> Hashem didn't reveal himself. To him. So the Rebbe said, oh, the fact that this story happened. And then it's enough that it happened, the fact that it was told by the, by the Friedrich Rebbe and it was put into the generation, which means all of a sudden it's relevant to us. We said, what? How is it relevant to us? You're gonna, he says, because from that point on, the Rebbe just says stuff like this, it's amazing, but he's saying it here also, that's why I bring it up. From that point on, Chinuch changed. You can now get a child to learn, not because you give him candies and sugar, but because you tell him Hashem is going to reveal himself to you. In other words, that his interest in learning, there's, like, there's a halach in Shulchan Aruch that you, you're supposed to reward children 
and with, with sweets, and when they get older, you award them with more impressive things like a car, you get people motivated you know, to learn by giving them things. It's, it's like a normal thing. It's, it's, it might look strange, but it's like you got to motivate them somehow. So he said, from that point on, since this information was, was publicized and told to us, it means it's relevant to every single person that you can tell a yid, a little baby, f- four or five years old, that if you learn, you're going to you're gonna see Hashem. And that will be enough to motivate them. It's crazy. He's saying the same thing here, basically. Once this happened to the Alter Rebbe, and it was told to us in the generations, it's true by every one of us. All of us can say, like, we're not satisfied with any revelations. Nothing <laughs> physical or spiritual can satisfy us, unless it's Atmos or in Sof. We're not interested. Why? Because the Alter Rebbe wasn't interested. What does that have to do with me? And it was like, he was on such a level that he got to Mamish Bria, you know, and, he, and it wasn't enough for him. It would be probably enough for us, No. So he's saying because he brought that into the world, it made it so that none of us are satisfied with anything but the Atmos. To the point, when it's not shining this, how much more so in the time of Gullah, that it's not even any revelation, close to what was going on in the base of Mikdash. So just because it's not shining, who bamats of the cusses? It automatically puts you into a state of pushing brokenness. You know what I mean? Broken. Normally, you think broken is that there's a guy capturing you from teaching a bunch of children underground and sending you to Siberia. You would think that that's broken. I would think that that's much more broken. The Rebbe is making an unbelievable chiddush here. He's saying no. The fact that their atzmus orin sof is shining makes you much, much more broken than that. That's like a that's like a minimal level of brokenness because it becomes during the the gezera. This brokenness of after the Gezer, the Rebbe is saying, is that's when it says the Jewish people were so broken that they re- achieved upon themselves the, the completion of the Torah. And that's a situation where they're just, they had everything. No one was trying to hurt them. But they were push it. It wasn't enough. They want the, the Geula Shlema, and that makes a person the ultimate brokenness. Well, because there was such gratitude and they felt unworthy. Who's they? The, the, he felt unworthy after the, the Gezer was over? Yeah. No, because they want Orin Sof. How, how many hot mikvahs and kosher sushi places can you have? How many good teachers and... and uh, they just come from a massive trauma. Right. And guess what? They got out of it. Yeah. So and now they... Ha- feel like, uh, you know, it creates an immense humility. Like, uh, yeah. It was. What he's trying to say is that it's not from the trauma that made them feel this way. It was from the fact that, okay, so now we have, it's the good times, Right. But the good times are not good enough. In other words, it's not, this is not the good times. For, for this, we went through trauma. In other words, this is not it. it so, so no one's trying to kill me. On the contrary, there's hundreds of thousands of people learning Torah and B'nai Brak. Not enough. The fact that the, we have Eretz Yisrael and Jewish people have a home, not enough. It's not enough. There, you can't give me enough. It, there, you can't count this on silver and gold or spiritual silver and gold. We want Mashiach now. We want unbelievable, unbridled, godly revelation in every single corner of the world. Short of that, I'm crushed like Mamash. I'm inside of a, a, more than inside of a, of a dangerous situation. That's what he's trying to say. And he's trying to say, he's proving it from the verses. Maybe it sounds strange to us. But he's saying that if you look at the actual Megillah, that's when it says they finally received the Torah. Now we learned, why did they receive the Torah? Because they were so crushed, they reached the luminary. So we thought that this was because they were crushed because Haman was trying to kill them. It turns out, just read the pshat, it wasn't because of that. It was because they didn't have the Geul Shlema. They had everything. They had Haman's house. Mordechai was second to the king. They were set up. But where's the Geul? We're still slaves to a this is, this, is, this is nothing. We're not interested. And it made them even more crushed, believe it or not, than all the trauma that they went through. And obviously the Rebbe, it's not a joke. I mean, it's not a secret anymore. The Rebbe's talking about our generation as opposed to the past generations. We are this blessed generation where we have a, a, a homeland in Eretz Israel for the first time in 2,000 years. That's not bad. We've got a Chabad house on every corner. It's not bad. We're learning the secrets of the Torah that have never been seen. Mamash is the time of Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai. All good and fine. But we're crushed to the point that it's that crushedness that is going to actually bring the Geula. It's like if you, if you think things are okay, you're not a candidate to basically reaching your Ma'or, your essence. And why, why would you be so sad? Seemingly you have everything. So this is what he's trying to bring out. A Yid is Pashit not satisfied with everything. He's only satisfied if he has Atzmus Orein Sov. And it can't be 
for a moment, like, you know, I, we can all kind of relate. Don't you kind of feel like something's terribly wrong all the time? <laughs> yeah. I do, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, this is what it is. It's like, it's, you can have everything. You've got, you've got a beautiful family. You've got everything good. You've got wonderful friends. You live in the holy city. What's wrong? Why are you so upset? This is the thing. Is you have to know why you're so upset. We want Mashiach now. That's it. We're not interested in anything else. It doesn't satisfy us. Nothing else can satisfy us but the full, blade, full on revelation of, of God in every corner of the world. At least it's good to know what's bothering you. <coughs> anyway, umavakesh gimel pamim b'chol yom or yosef, and we we request three times a day or more. V'sechazena ineinu b'shuva chalatziyom barachami. Let our eyes see your return to Zion in Rachamim. Shaaz yagili lukus va'ad lagili atzmus. Because then there'll be mamish the full thing. We'll have the revelation of God up until and including the revelation of the Atzmus mamish v'zeu kasis l'maor, and that's what it means crushed to reach the luminary. Sha'al yidi ha'inyan the kasis that through this idea of being crushed mizeshanim tzayim begalus just from the fact that you're found in galus, not from any other cause, magim l'maor you reach to the luminary. Because this, the, the, the real will of every Jew is the total revelation of godliness. And it doesn't let him rest. It's so important to him. It's, it's nogeya. It's relevant to his essential being. He's essentially sick. That's what it says. Chole. The word for sick is 49 levels. You can, it, it means we're sick. We're, there's something wrong with us. We feel like there's like something bothering us at the essential core. From the from from the fact that there's not a gilia lukus, shelachin who nish barbenitka kus is mizesh bezman a galus lo yesh gilia lukus, and he's just broken from the fact that at the time of galus, the lights are not on. Where does this come from? Who mitzad etam and neshama? This feeling that something's wrong is the essence of your soul feels that there's something wrong. So basically, when you're feeling it, it means you're feeling something essential inside of you. Right, the ma'or shabbat neshama. It's the luminary of the neshama that requires the like the the luminary to be everywhere, and so basically, when you're feeling this lack and it's no gaya to your etzim that it's not all happening, it's because you have an essence and the essence should be shining in full everywhere. So when it's, when you're feeling this brokenness because you're in gulas, what you're feeling is the essence of your soul. She's kashrus belukus. He's kashrus atzmis. Who's its and why is that? Because its Connection to God is an essential connection which can never go away. If it's you're, 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 you're feeling a lack of it because of some makif level of your soul, for example. Like we said that your soul above sees God. That soul above that sees God is a part of your soul which is not the essence of your soul. It's part of the revelations of your soul. You understand what I'm saying? It's the light. The essence is here and it shines a revelation all the way until it reaches into your body. So all the place of your soul between your body and the essence is called the revelation of your soul. If your faith is based on the fact that that part of your soul sees Hashem, like we said before, that you have a makif level of faith, then revelations will calm you down. In other words, if you're experiencing mere revelations, not the essence, so that part of your soul is sort of, sort of like satisfied. But the part of your soul which is never satisfied is the essential part of your soul. That part of your soul cannot, it's not interested in revelations alone. It's interested in the full ascent, essence of God being revealed in every place. And therefore, until that happens, it's, it's sad. It's not, it's crushed. Okay, so the mechanics of that, you see the mimer is pretty much not over at all. So there's a whole mechanics of this. How does this exactly work? And more or less what we're going to try and investigate right now is why specifically is being crushed in a trauma situation, like Aleph was saying, why is that not more crushedness than, or at least equal crushedness? It's also gullus, right? Why, why, is like, why are we saying that specifically after the decree is over, we reach this level of crushedness and not during the decree, said, when the trauma is happening? You said it's an essential part that the moment is happening. But we had already said that what does Mordechai do? Mordechai bring, connects you to your essence. Right. 
The whole idea of kasis lama, or crush to reach the luminary, in the Friedrich Rebbe's Mimer, we didn't get into any of this, and we were plenty talking about the essence of the soul. Because the idea is that when you're crushed in the gullis, which certainly happens when a big bad Haman is coming after you, so the Friedrich Rebbe or, Ham, or uh, Mordechai, whoever's going to be, he brings you to your essence, and suddenly you're standing there with Mesiris Nefesh, 22,000 children in the middle of the street, learning Torah when they could kill you for it any second. So that's, why do you do that? Because you're having Mesiris Nefesh because you reached your essence. No question that also that reaches your essence. It does. That's the whole Mimer of the Friedrich Rebbe is based on. When you're crushed, even in the, in the negative times, when there's a decree, decree, certainly you reach your essence. That's the whole point. Crushed to the luminary. But the Rebbe is adding this crazy idea that even, you're even more crushed when there's no oppression against you. And that's what we're going to investigate now. Why more crushed? First of all, okay, you have to like explain to me why I'm even crushed. Okay, now I can get it a little bit. Okay, that's why I'm bummed out all the time. That's why there's something wrong with reality, basically, and I, I can't shake it. But more crushed, and they're throwing me in a Soviet prison. So this is the mechanics of this. How, why does it really work like that? So, Yud. Lomar. We can say, Shebechines Hamma'or de Nashama. The level of the ma'or, ah, so we already, he's already indicated there's different levels of the ma'or, of the luminary. The level of the ma'or, of the neshama, hamizgalis, which is revealed, all yidea in the kasis, mizeshenim tzayim begalis, from the brokenness of just merely being in galis, hinailis yoser, it's higher, mechines hamar de neshama shemizgalis, all yidea mysterious nefesh, it's even a higher then the level of your, lum- your soul's luminary, your essence, that comes out when you have to go kamikaze mysterious nefesh in terms of risking your life for Torah mitzvahs. Like the Stalin or the, the time of the decree of Haman. Vayinyin who... And the idea is like this. How does it work? One of the reasons Shabbat and Torah... The Ramadan Torah, Haisa Rak Haskala. The Ramadan Torah was merely the beginning. Hey as it says, they began to do a Ramadan Torah, but they finished at Purim. Uvimeh Chashverosh Haisa Kabbalah. And the days of Chashverosh was the reception, the final reception, as it says in the Megillah, the Kibbal HaYehudim. Hu Kizesh Akdimu Nasa Lanish Ramadan Torah. It's because this that they said we will do and then we will understand. We'll do and then we'll hear. At Ramadan Torah, why do they do that? It's because, as we said earlier in a different class, Hashem held the mountain over their head like a barrel. And He basically said, you accept my Torah good, if not, I'm going to drop it on your heads. That happened. <coughs> and what, as we said before, as we said before, and He brings here um, from Torah Or, okay, that he says, who remembers how we explained that? It was, it was basically like, although we accepted it, we were like, if you don't accept it, you're going to die. So it really was like not as much free will. But the second time we accepted it without any pressure, we wanted to choose it. So it was like a different okay. situation. Yes. But the thing is, how do, we, how do we re-explain the words, he held the mountain over their heads like a barrel? We like Hasidicized that pretty, pretty intensely. Who remembers how we retranslated that? What? Exactly, exactly. Very good, excellent. So basically, the Alter Rebbe explains a pretty hot, like hot drusha there. He says, what does it mean a mountain? So a mountain goes on Avram, Avinu. We just said this the other day, but not everyone was paying attention or here, I guess. But there's the idea of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. <coughs> Each of them called the the, mount, the, the, base of Mik, the place of the base of Mikdash, they called it a different, a different name. Avram called it a mountain. Yitzchak <coughs> called it a... Field and Yaakov called it a house. Mm. So therefore, we know that the only and that's love, Chesed, Gevur, and Tiferes, basically. So the whole idea of a mountain, in general, in Chassidus, when you see the word mountain, it it, ref, it refers to the Indian of Avraham because he called it a mountain. And what is a mountain? It's like a protrusion, basically. It's the Indian of love, which protrudes. It's like a, it's an extends itself. So when it says Hashem held the mountain over us, oh, love. He's basically, what it means is that he revealed himself to us. It was like an unbelievable revelation of God to the point that it forced us to take on the Torah. We have, how could you not 
do anything <laughs> that is asked of you at the moment when the living God is mamish manu imanu asking you to do something for him. You know, you're like, okay, <laughs> okay. Are you talking about the point where God actually spoke to us and we all died for a moment? Yeah, the whole experience, basically. Whatever, I don't know, the whole experience of being at Har Sinai, and yes, the revelation of Hashem was a nice of an Ishma situation. I mean, we, we, he was too much love. He was, he was, I mean, forget, you could say that, but what about like 10 plagues and splitting the sea and the whole business? Man was already falling in the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. We were in the midst of such an like a unbridled love of the Creator in a revealed way. We're going to do whatever he says. Like what? He just like freed two million people from a land that not one slave ever got away from. And we all went out and we all, you know what I'm saying, with rich millionaires laden with gold and silver. You know, okay, like <laughs> I'll take the Torah. You know, this is what happened. It was, it was, it was forced upon us from love. Is the, that's what has changed. The, the idea is that we were afraid, we, we accepted it under duress, but the duress was love. And that goes much better when it says it's a gilu milamayla. What, the, what he's trying to say is that what was the difference between Matan Torah and, and, and Purim is that in Matan Torah there was a revelation from above. That's what caused us to exist. We saw light. And as you said, the real difference was in the days of Chashverosh, there, was, was, there was no light. There was no revelation. We had to do it on our own. So this was one of the main things we said. So he says, V'yesh Lomar. Therefore, Shamuna the Israel, the faith of the Jewish people, Mitzadzesh and Neshama Shalamai Leroa Elokus. We already discussed this at great length. The faith that we have from the fact that our soul above sees God, right? As we said before, there's a part of your soul which is not in your body, which is looking at Hashem and it has an effect on your body that makes you believe in God. And that's called a Muna Shemitzad Siba. We already said that's called a Muna based on a cause. It's not essential faith. You believe because of something, not you, not you be because you believe essentially you have nothing else to, but to believe because you are a piece of God. This is no, this is a level down from there. You're already see, you're an entity separate from God, but you're seeing there's a God, therefore you believe based on your seeing. So, who, al derech shakdimu nasal nishma. This level of faith is very similar to the concept of our reception of the Torah due to the fact that Hashem showed us Himself. Why did we receive the Torah? Because, right? Based on a cause that Hashem showed us revelation. Why do we believe in God? Because our soul above is seeing a revelation all the time. So these are, these are connected with each other. The, 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 the makif dik of faith that a person has is very similar to the the quasi-reception of Torah that a person has, it's all based on a cause. So yes, it's faith. Yes, it's a reception of the Torah on some level. But it's like questionable. Because if that cause, let's say, would not be there, would you still believe? So it's not essential. <coughs> it all comes mitzad gila milamayla. It's from a revelation of above. Tzeh hashverosh mitzad atzma. Whereas the, this, that they received it in the days of Chashverosh by themselves, who ki az nizgalis kashtush belukush mitzad etzim neshama. It's because then, and this is back to the point we were just mentioning, there was an essential connection to their essence that ar- arose due to Mordechai, which we said in the previous part of the Mimer, he reached a level in this depart- department more than Moshe Rabbeinu himself did, because Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have the option of bringing Yidin to Messias Nefesh. So suddenly revealed from the Raya Mahemna, watch what I can do now. And he basically, what he did was, he connected us to our essence. And this is why there was no revelations. We, we didn't decide at that time to suddenly believe in Hashem and do all the mitzvahs and accept the Torah because of some cause from above. Right? Because there, there was no light. There was no revelation. Hashem was not giving us man. And on the contrary, He was taking away every ounce of of godly revelation that could be. The great Jewish people who the whole world was created for, they're in the hands of some wicked king and his henchmen and they're going to die from... What the heck is this? That is anything but godliness. And nonetheless, we decided to believe in Hashem and we decided to receive the Torah. You can see then, it comes from not a cause. There's no cause in the world that could make us do that. It came because essentially that's who we are. It brought out our essence. You don't need a cause. I don't need a reason to believe. I essentially believe. I essentially want the Torah, not because it's so great and lovely and light. 
This is Kashrus Atmis Mitzad Etzema Mitziyusam. It was an essential connection that came out suddenly due to their very being. Who they are, who a Jew is. It showed who we really are. We are Torah people. We are God's people. It doesn't matter if you give us a reason or not give us a reason. So you can see actually in the dark times, you can see the essence more than you can in the light times. This is just in general, not to, uh, you know, there's one time Rabbi Gafsi told me this story. He was, just to, to, for a second, he was uh, asked to speak. I don't know exactly all the details, but he was in, he went on some trip. He was collecting money for yeshiva and he went and he saw a guy who was actually a chassid of the Friedrich Rebbe, Mamish, this old man. And he, he was in the Friedrich Rebbe's court and he was like his chassid and he was sitting there by and there was a whole bunch of people Rabbi Gafni had like already ga- gained some of what a name for himself you know it was the Rosh Yeshiva there and it was like it was, it was Suda Shlishi and someone said okay like say chassidus so they put, pointed to him give over some chassidus so he was a little nervous you know it was like in front of this chassid you know but he's like they, okay so he started saying chassidus about the milas of the gullus basically this concept we're talking about right now that in the darkness it sucks but one thing that's good about it is that you can see the essence come out. Because you can't see the essence come out in when the times are good. Because you're blinded by the light. Even if you would, let's say, have an essential connection to Torah. Even if it's true that in the times of Moshe, they accepted the Torah because they are just Torah people. And they can't do anything else. You can't really tell that because there's so much light and revelation. Anybody looking, including themselves, can say, I accepted it because of all the light and revelation. It's impossible to see their essential being come out when light is shining. So one good thing about the Gullahs is you can see what a Yid really is. Even in the midst of a Holocaust, he's not leaving this God. Even in the midst of, all they had to do was say, I don't want to be Jewish anymore in the days of Haman. And not one person even thought to do that. because there is, So you could see the essence. So he's busy saying like a mimer like this. And this old Chassid tapped him on the leg and he said, don't get so excited about how great the Gullahs is. And I, now I, every time I talk about this word, I have to tell, I have to say that part of it. In other words, as great as it is, we shouldn't get so excited about it. But it has a certain mila. <coughs> okay, so that's the mila. So he was th- this rabbi was uh, around during the time of the Holocaust. For sure. I mean, well, I don't. Yeah, for sure. Rabbi Gaffney, you know. No, Rabbi Gaffney, and maybe also. No, he wasn't, but. Uh, he was probably, maybe he was actually. I don't know how old he is. It's kind of like olives and olive oil. You stomp on the olives to get the oil. Fast. Yeah. <coughs> so he says. Okay. So this in the time of Achashverosh, it brought there for our, our essence. Uve pratius yoser. So now this is the point of this paragraph. In detail, further detail, Yesh Lomar. What's that? Maybe he was around. I mean, it's definitely quite possible. Yeah. Depends on like one decade there. We're not sure how old he is. Probably he was. Mm-hmm. Certainly that chassid was around. Mm-hmm. Anyway, with Pratius Yosur Yesh Lomar. In detail, further detail we could say, Shigam Begilui Etzaman Neshama. That even when it comes to the revelation of the essence of the soul, Yeshnam Dugmas Shnei in Yanim Hanal, you have the same, he puts in. In bracket, in, bra- in bra- whatever brackets, like there's an example of. You can't say it's the exact same things. We're talking about inside the essence right now. But even inside the essence, you have a similar parallel between this notion of when there's light, and therefore the essence is not shining, and when there's dark, and when the essence is shining. Okay. Shnei in Yanim Hanal that are mentioned a, m- a moment ago. What were the two things we mentioned a moment, a mon- a moment ago? Believing, believing or receiving the Torah because of a cause versus believing and receiving the Torah because it's your essence. So he says, even in the essence itself, even in the ma'or, you have an example of these two things. When the essence of the neshama comes out because of mesiris nefesh, because you have to do something even though someone's trying to kill you, Yesh Lomar. So we can say, Shibinogela Kochos Hagiluim, who Kamo Davar Nosaf. So this is a deep thing. I'll try and make it simple. He says, we can say there, first of all, we have to know what's the difference between the what is a, What does it mean, Kochos Hagiluim? Anyone is familiar with this, what we mean when we say those words, Davido? I mean, the power of the revelation, basically. Kochos Hagiluim. 
not power of revelation. The powers of it, like the bringing forth, the like powers of it, basically. What are kochos hagiluim? If you could name a few. Kochos hagiluim means the revealed powers, not powers of revelation, but the revealed powers. What are the revealed powers? Basically, your ten spheros are called mm-hmm. your called your revealed powers. Mm-hmm. You have other powers, but you're your non-revealed powers. Mm-hmm. That's like your faith and your power of mysterious yeah. nefesh, and your your um, sort of your will and your pleasure. All the things that are associated with the kesser, basically. Oh. All those things I just said yeah, are all associated with the kesser. Okay. All the things that are associated from chokma and below, they're called your revealed powers because basically. That's when the worlds begin. Reishis, Chochmah is the beginning, is Chochmah, and then that's called, the, that's called a world. So inside of ourselves, we also have like, what's called the worldly part of ourselves and the beyond worldly part of ourselves, which is our Chochmah and below, our ten spheres, and then beyond that is called like, our hidden powers, Keser, which is associated with mysterious nefesh, again, faith, will, pleasure, all these types of things that go, that go on the Keser. So he says like this, that when a person has mysterious nefesh because someone's trying to kill you and you're still doing Yiddishkeit and so forth, he says, in, in relationship to your revealed powers, which is your intellect, your emotions, your thought, speech, and action, this can be considered like what we call a Dover Nosaf. What does it mean a Dover Nosaf? It means a secondary thing which is applied to and affecting your revealed powers, but it is not actually part of an, a thing in and of your revealed powers itself. In other words, that it's, a, it's a kind of concept like your mysterious nefesh takes over your conscious being and all the parts of you that are revealed, means the part of you that you think is you, your personality, who you are, you know, what makes you tick on a revealed level, all those things basically become seized by your power of mysterious nefesh, if it should, God forbid, have to arise in this way. And you'll do things which don't make sense according to your intellect, they don't make sense according to your emotions, they don't make sense according to you at all. Because your essence has taken over, basically. And your essence does not need to ask your mind or your heart how it feels about sacrificing your life to God. It knows exactly how it feels about that, and it's going to tell your heart and mind how it feels about that, and shut them down and make you do things that you would never do in a million years. Because that's what a yid is. But the thing is, is that this is still a situation where it's, it's a cause, as it were. It's something separate to and acting upon your revealed powers. It's not, your revealed powers, as it were, are not along for the ride. Put it like that. They're seized. They're overtaken. And that's what's called in the mind here, a dover nosa. They're like an, a, your, your mysterious nefesh is an add-on to the regular you. It's not, it's not really part of you. It's not, a, it's not what you're thinking. It's something that overtakes you, your soul. <laughs> and he says, And we see this, moment, especially, the, you know, the Rebbe saw this in the, in the people that were in front of him in the, in, when he was speaking, in the, in the Fabrengans. He says, especially the characters that were assembled in that room. These were Mamish people from Russia, Siberia, that saw the worst of the worst. Not, you know, Germany, the whole business. Who, he said, We see the Paul Mamish, many people, that they were there in a place that there was decrees against Torah mitzvahs, right? They had literal mysterious nefesh for many years in a row. They were daily sacrificing their life. All they had to do was cut their beard. All they had to do was not walk around like a chassid, call themselves a Russian name, not teach their kids in cheder. They could have done a million things. They lived a life of mysterious nefesh, walking through the street, ready to die at any moment, just because, they, from, so to speak, their own choice of being Jewish as opposed to completely assimilating. And he says, And when they came afterwards to countries like this one, that they can, now they can do mitzvahs all day long, no one's going to bother you, no one's trying to kill you. Guess what? We don't see their unbridled mysterious nefesh on them anymore. That they had before. They're not living at the same state of like kamikaze, right? Now that they're in a safe place, they relaxed. They relax. They're not crazy. They're just happy to, no one's bothering them anymore. Leave me alone. I'll drink my kosher milk. I'll go to the Rebbe's for bringing. And that's all the mysterious nefesh I need, buddy. Thanks. I had enough. So what happened here? 
They were literally living like a life of unbridled, passionate faith to Hashem, that they, daily they were risking their lives for God. And obviously it was not really them, because as soon as they got into a situation where they didn't have to do that anymore, they went back to being themselves. And that mysterious nefesh, this hidden powers, went into a hiding place again and stopped basically seizing their body and in, 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 in doing what it wants with it. What would it look like if they didn't lose that mysterious nefesh? What would they be looking like? They'd be looking, they'd be, they'd be, they'd be having the same unbelievable power of mitzvahs, like in a way that it, it, was, it was irrational. In other words, they would be doing mitzvahs irrationally. When you get to, mitzvahs in a certain sense are irrational anyway. But when you get to a place where you can just do mitzvahs, you can, you, you can relax. It becomes the normal life. Like I said, bring me my kosher milk. I'm going to go visit the Rebbe. And I'm gonna, now I can live a normal life. Whereas before, they were, they, they were living irrationally based on their Torah mitzvahs. They could be killed for it at any moment. That irrationally went away because they the irrationality did not permeate their revealed powers. It just seized them temporarily. And when the, and when the problem went away, so their mysterious nefesh also went away. You can also like to create drama to create uh, meaning as well. Well, if you can, you don't, unfortunately, we, we don't have to make up drama, no, right? If, in terms of history, what he's talking about, no, but people also, I think, in sort of a mundane, uh, sort of bourgeois wow. lifestyle, and they want to create drama to create meaning, or people go towards drugs or something, or it's true. in stupid situations to almost yeah. give themselves some kind of feelings. 100%. Like, what? Conspiracy theories as well, like the things that, you know. Yeah. But I would argue, I would argue that all of that is coming from us yeah. because we are ultimately the cause of it is that we're we, we're bugged out that the ghoul is not here in other words we don't the, all the drama that we create you're right it's false drama because if, if we could take it we're not aware of what's causing all of our unrest we're all unrest we're all creating dramas but the dramas it's like it's like a pretend drama as you're saying because the real drama that's bothering us is that we don't have ghoul ashleem and we're just like broken from this so we go into all kinds of who knows what Start making dramas for our lives. But the, the central, wow. centrality of all the drama, I totally agree with you. We create these weird realities just because we want a place to put our unrest that at least makes sense. Okay, my girlfriend broke up with me. That's why I'm upset. That's right. not really why you're upset. Or I'm a drug addict. That's why I'm upset. You're upset because the Gaula Shlema is not here. But you, you can't... If that was the case, you know what you would look like? You would look like a kamikaze yid. You'd look like the Rebbe. If you were bothered on a daily basis, you couldn't sleep at night. Like I told you the story yesterday about the Friedrich Rebbe and his, and his number one secretary, they didn't even have a half an hour <laughs> to allow themselves to daven shachris. You know, that's pretty much like, it's, 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 it's a racy thing, I'll be a lacha. You know, they couldn't daven shachris in a half an hour. When they were, because how could you rest for one second? There's yidn out, you know, you know we, we go to bed at night, we put our head down and pretend that we can sleep soundly, you know. But really, we're, we're in a state of unbelievable unrest all the time. We don't even just realize what's, what's driving it. It's because we want Mashiach now. And if we really connected with that, we would be kamikaze on the mission of Yiddishkeit every single second of our lives. We would be like those Jews in Russia, broken and living at a higher level of a dimension of our own selves because we want Mashiach now, because there's a lack of revelation. Okay, this we're going to have to get to tomorrow. Shkoyach, shkoyach. Powerful stuff. That animal that seizes over our bodies, that's what we have to feed or else we're not going to be happy. The one that could just seize all of our stuff.